The question before us today, is the fourth gospel accurate and reliable? Should it be considered a primary authority or as a secondary reference? Um, is it inerrant? Is it 100% infallible and authoritative? Or are there elements of truth and uh, elements of fiction combined in one account? Is it historical or is it po primarily poetic? Uh, should it be considered apocryphal, having elements of truth, but being largely fiction? So this is what we're digging in today. Um, in the description, there's a quote by James Dunn. Uh, if anyone knows who James Dunn is, I will go into a little bit about him. But uh, we'll, we'll address that. But also in the description are several references into the material that I'm going to be covering and referencing. In uh, this presentation uh, begins with a... Um, an article I posted on Facebook a couple days ago on uh, the problems, the problem of the fourth gospel, which has excerpts from a book, um, which outlines, you know, the excerpts I took in that article were just from one chapter of this book, uh, chapter five. And uh, in that chapter, it contrasts the, uh, the book of John, the gospel of John with the synoptic gospels. And it draws pretty, pretty stark <laughs> contrasts. Good to see everyone in the chat. Um, praise God. So without further ado, I will proceed. And I want to address my motive for pursuing this issue or addressing this issue. And the motive is primarily in the pursuit of truth and knowledge. Um, that's the primary motive. There's no theological motive here. Actually, it's by and large Trinitarians that have raised questions about John and have rejected John as being a primary authority for the historical Jesus um, to the last um, century and a half, or two centuries, actually. Um, rather, it's to bring reform to Christian belief and practice on a more solid and defensible foundation. To emphasize the fundamentals of the gospel by identifying pri primary or fundamental authorities within the traditional canon by excluding those that should be considered secondary authorities um, as primary authorities, not excluding them from the canon, but um, making primary reference in terms of core essential belief and practice with those foundational authorities, which can be demonstrated to have the highest level of credibility and accuracy. Um, it's not to undermine faith but to facilitate belief and practices in accordance uh, with the truth and to avoid the pitfalls and the complications of tradition and ideological motivations uh, that's, that, that uphold uh, these traditions, which, you know, there are, there, is the tradi there are traditions of the doctrine of the Trinity, there are traditions of dogma, but a lot of people don't realize the canon of scripture and what is defined as scripture is also a tradition that doesn't go back to the first century. It goes back um, pretty much to the uh, fourth century, later fourth century, but has wasn't really codified as dogma um, by a church authority until the seventh century. So, should we rely on um, the seventh century Eastern Orthodox Church to tell us what Scripture is? I mean, if we don't trust them to tell us what the fundamental doctrines are of the faith, why should we tell, why should we trust them to tell us what the foundational authorities of our Christian faith are? So the Reformation continues, you know, it, it went a long way to, to making those, those reforms, but it didn't go long, far enough in restoring Christianity to its first century roots. It didn't go far enough, um, especially in terms of uh, getting back to the historical Jesus and in terms of um, evaluating the canon and the tradition of the canon uh, and the uh, critically evaluating uh, the books in the New Testament as what can be distinguished as being foundational. What does it mean to be a Christian? Well, this is a good question that... Um, we have to ask because some fundamentalists in this day and age will say, well, if you don't accept 
inerrancy or infallibility of scripture is, is it's been handed to us, then you're not a true believer, you're a false believer or something like that. Well, in the first century, in the first you know few centuries, there were there was no canon, there was no dogmatic list of books which believers were expected to uphold as scripture. The New Testament scripture, as we know, it didn't exist in the first century. There were isolated books, narrations, and, and letters which were circulated independently later in the first century, but it was never consolidated, and there was never any kind of confirmation of what is what is validated or what is uh, what is endorsed versus what is rejected as a uh, as a scriptural witness. So early Christians. Uh, primarily responded to the pre the preacher and the oral tradition of how the gospel was communicated orally. And in fact, the, the earliest um, Catholic and Orthodox church didn't emphasize the written, uh, 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 the letters over the tradition. They put the sacred tradition first. And although I, I disagree with what they um, believe was the original tradition, um, it, it was clear from a very early stage the, the tradition was regarded at a higher level than um, Scripture as we know it, New Testament Scripture. I already um, brought up the point, you know, it's kind of inconsistent or hypocritical that we should reject Orthodox dogma and, and uh, the creeds of the 4th through the 7th century but we, we, we uphold um, their tradition of canon. Um, so to be, to be really honest and uh, in, in uh, search of the original or earliest tradition, we need to be objective and we need to analyze how we got with the canon we are, why the canon is what it is, and to further converge on within the traditional canon, what, what books are at a higher level foundational authorities and what books are second secondary references or set or supplemental to those foundational authorities. But don't take my word for it. Examine the issues and decide for yourself. You know, what I can do here is I can provide the arguments, the rationale for, for, for what the issues are with John and what, and why John shouldn't be regarded as historically accurate. Um, and you can decide for yourself whether it's a foundational authority for you or whether it's not. I don't reject it. I don't suggest we should take it out of the canon. That I think we should maintain the traditional canon. But within the traditional canon, we can make distinctions of foundational versus uh, supplemental or secondary uh, references. Um, I would also say that even if John isn't historically accurate to a high degree. It shouldn't be dis discarded um, in the sense that it conveys, I believe it conveys uh, important truths and insights to what Christian uh, belief um, entails. And so I, I, I think there's tremendous va value in it in terms of a theological presentation. Uh, and so I have no issues with it theologically at all. Uh, the question is whether it is uh, historically reliable. Now, let, let me uh, address here the, the development of canon. Uh, the development of canon is a, a process that took several centuries to, to arrive at. The first canon was actually uh, the Marcionite canon. Um, this is the first time someone put together a list of um, of New Testament writings that were that were as a list defined as the the uh, a canon. You know those authorities that uh, uh, Marcion um, in the, the middle second century uh, defined. And the reason why there wasn't some previous canon is, again, because sacred tradition was regarded over, over scripture. There's this, this presumption that like the canon was given to the apostles, that the canon was defined in the first century by the apostles. That's not the case.
the canon as we know it in, in modern use is defined by it uh, dogmatized in the seventh century, um, listed in the fourth century, and then there's other lists that precede um, the the list of of three eighty two, but those lists don't exactly match the modern canon. So before uh, three eighty two, there's no list by any authority, uh, scho- you know, uh, theologian church father that exactly matches the modern canon. So here I want to address fundamentalists um, and, and fundamentalism, which really resists asking questions, asking uh, honest questions about what we've taken for granted as uh, primary authorities in scripture. Uh, it's something that fundamentalists are strongly resistant to and will have a dogmatic uh, reactionary response to. Uh, cognitive dissidence is when any new information uh, challenges challenges one's current beliefs so much that they uh, presume that it cannot be true. So, so what people do who are, are so um, adamant dogmatically about Scripture and what Scripture is based on what's been handed down to them, um, that they just, it's so contrary to what they believe, they just presume it can't be true without even digging into the information. And so they'd rather put their head in the sand and come to terms than to come to terms with the issues of textual criticism and historical reliability. Rather, they just gloss over them. There's a massive blind spot when it comes to critical scholarship. You know, they'll, they'll focus on a version of the Bible and English translation, but with complete no, with with a complete absolute reference to critical scholarship, to the context of uh, when these writings were developed, how they were developed, the how they're attested to, authorship date, internal evaluation, external evidence for um, how well they're attested. Uh, they f- they use fear and intimidation to make others afraid to investigate the issues and question their dogma. Uh, and they'll resort to banter, trash talking, and slander, uh, essentially demonizing people who disagree with them, uh, and also mischaracterize their opponent. And some of you might have seen this recently. Uh, but yeah, this is, this is the reactionary response uh, of people who hold to a superstition of scripture that um, without objectively <laughs> looking into the issues. They're so afraid to even look into the issues and in question, and they want to make you afraid to question and to evaluate uh, objectively uh, what the truth is. So let me re- make a first reference to James D. D. G. Dunn. Uh, here is a brief synopsis of his uh, his career. Uh, he's one of the the, the greatest re- modern scholars, recent scholars, uh, prolific in writing books. The thing about James uh, Dunn is um, he's he's one of the most honest Trinitarian scholars out there. He'll say things about John one, uh, the prologue. And he'll say things about uh, Philippians 2 that aren't um, exactly uh, uh, consistent with the talking points of, of, of mainline Trinitarian uh, interpretation on those, on those passages. What we see with James Dunn is a higher level of integrity and um, objectiveness in, in his evaluation of the Pauline writings, the, the Gospels, and the New Testament as a whole. He was the president of a, a body, an international body for New Testament study, um, which is a very um, prestigious um, position. So here's just sort of an outline of his books. Uh, I have some errors at one of the most, some of the most notable books. Uh, but later in his career is um, the three, the three volume. Um, so here, here's the quote I want to make reference to. Uh, it's a two-part quote. In volume one of Jesus Remembered, 
uh, Christianity in the making. Um, so he alludes to an 1847 F.C. Bear produced a powerful case for a conclusion that the fourth gospel was never intended to be a, a strictly historical gospel. Given the strength of his critique, the inevitable conclusion could hardly be avoided. John's gospel is um, de determined much more by John's own the theological than by historical concerns. Consequently, it cannot be regarded as a good source for the life of Jesus. The conclusion by no means became, the, became established straight away, but for those at the forefront of the quest for the historical Jesus, the die had been cast. The differences between John and the others, which had previously been glossed over, could no longer be ignored. It was no longer possible to treat all four Gospels on the same level. If the first three Gospels were historical, albeit in qualified measure, then such were these differences, that John's Gospel could no longer be regarded as historical. Over the next hundred years, the character of John's Gospel is theological rather than historic, a historical document became more and more axiomatic for New Testament scholarship. So he's reviewed the literature, he's reviewed critical scholarship, and he's, he's um, pointing light that for a century, you know, there was a prolific amount of uh, critical scholarship between about 1850 and 1950, where this realization that John can't be regarded as historically reliable became more and more axiomatic. It's, it's established as, as the, um, the majority, not just the majority, but it's, it's, it's established as what scholarship um, attests to, that um, by, the, by, by the mid 1900s, it's a settled issue pretty much. Um, so let's continue here. Few scholars would regard John as a source for information regarding Jesus' life and ministry, this is James Dunn, in any degree comparable to the synoptics. Few scholars. It's worth noting briefly the factors which have been considered of enduring sig significance to this point. So he's highlighting here the primary rationale uh, th and this is just the tip of the iceberg here, but but he's pointing at, at some of the, the major observations and issues. Um, and it's I sh should also know it's been an open secret for the last century that this is settled scholarship pretty much. You know, there's a few conservatives at the far end uh, who, who resist this, but people like James Dunn are fully aware and fully convinced uh, of, of this being the reality. Uh, so here we go with the first point here. One is the very different picture of Jesus's ministry, both in the order and significance of events. So the chronology and the significance of, of the events, what events are being uh, made light of, particularly in the cleansing of the temple and the raising of Lazarus. In the location of Jesus' ministry, predominantly in Jerusalem, you know, with respect to John, rather than in Galilee with respect to the synoptics. Another is the striking difference in Jesus' style and speaking, much more discursive and theological, that is in John, in contrast to the aphoristic, which is like, uh, you know, uh, minimalistic speech uh, and parabolic style of the synoptics. As Strauss has already pointed out, the style is consistent, whether Jesus speaks to Nicodemus or the widow at the well or to his disciples, and very similar to the style of the Baptist, as indeed of, of 1 John. The inference is inescapable that the style is of that of the evangelist rather than that of the Jesus. 
stylistically, that is that the dialogue, uh, the style in which the characters speak are, are all um, similar. And that is an indication that it's the author, the evangelist, the editor, um, who, um, whose style is being um, brought into the words of the characters within the gospel. Probably the most important of all is in the synoptics, Jesus' principal theme is the kingdom of God, and he rarely speaks of himself. Whereas in, the, in John, the kingdom of God hardly features, and the discourses are largely vehicles for expressing Jesus' self-consciousness and self-proclamation. Had the striking I am self-assertions of John been remembered as spoken by Jesus, how could any evangelist have ignored them so completely as the Gospels do? You know, in John, we have numerous I am statements, and there's not one, I, you know, there, there's no, nothing comparable in the synoptics. Uh, uh, and if Jesus made these I am statements, they would be uh, critical to pointing out the identification of who Jesus is, and, and there's be no reason uh, for the uh, the authors of the synoptic gospels to omit that, and the the fact that it's omitted points to the fact that um, uh, points to a big issue. So, in conclusion, with J this quote from James Dunn, on the whole, the position is unchanged. Basically, he's saying, I, I concur with the critical scholarship that came before me. John's gospel cannot be regarded as a source for the life and teaching of Jesus to the same order as the synoptics. We shall certainly want to call upon John's gospel as a source, but mostly as a secondary source to supplement or corroborate the testimony of the synoptic tradition. So this is John's John Dunn's, James Dunn's position. <laughs> uh, this is my, you know, this is my position. Uh, it's not outside uh, the main stream of Christian uh, critical scholarship. It might be an open secret in the sense that lay people and people who just attend church and don't have any um, understanding of the issues, they might not realize this. But, um, you know, pe people who've investigated these issues pretty much, you know, <laughs> come to the same conclusion. Um, John should be a primary, shouldn't be a primary source for the historical Jesus. It should be used, it should be referred to as a secondary source, uh, as, as a supplementary source. Uh, and a quote from C.H. Dodd is also telling uh, from his book, The Authority of the Bible, um, who is also prolific in many books and uh, a well-established modern scholar. It is therefore worthwhile to ex exercise the most strenuous, stren st strenuous historical criticism in seeking to recover the earliest and most trustworthy forms of the gospel tradition a century of such criticism has not been without result. He's, again, acknowledging that there was a century of this criticism. There were dozens of books written evaluating and analyzing John. And we may now say with confidence that for strictly historical material, with the minimum of subjective interpretation, we must not go to the fourth gospel. Okay? Okay. He's, you know, he's acknowledging and he's looking at <laughs> the scholarship, the history, and, and the st and, and where you know it rests. That the result of the scholarship is that we ne can now say with confidence we've now come to the point where it is clear that the Gospel of John has a lower level of historical accuracy than than that of the uh, Synoptics. But then again, its religious value stands beyond challenge, and it is more fully appreciated when its contribution to our knowledge of the bare facts of the life of Jesus become of a secondary interest. 
its value is when we don't see it as as being a, a true history, a true dialogue. We, we see it as conveying theological truths. It becomes a, a value. It is not to say that it makes no su such con uh, contribution, but it is to the synoptic gospels that we must go if we wish to recover the oldest and purest tradition of the facts. It is to the synoptic gospels that we must go if we wish to recover the oldest and tr purest tradition of the facts. These gospels can si overlap, diverge, confirm and contradict one another in a way that is at first simply perplexing. So he's saying even if we go to the synoptics, there are issues in, in harmonizing them. But out of these curious interactions of the three, it has been possible to deduce a gradually increasing mass of probable conclusions about the earliest sources upon which they rest. So if, if we do the analysis between the synoptics, we can come to a higher level of confidence uh, of the life and ministry of Christ what that entails. Um, so now I'm going to dive into the actual issues. Those are just sort of uh, some quotes by modern scholars to sort of introduce the topic. But now I'll, I'll actually dive into the specific issues that are brought up over and over again by, by scholars. The first one here, uncertain authorship. Some of these will be um, corroborated by, by quotes. Uh, the reason for the widespread abandonment of the full apostolic authorship of the gospel is the clearer recognition that the external evidence is indecisive. It is not until we reach the last quarter of the second century, until we reach the last quarter of the second century, that Arrhenius provides us with our first unambiguous witness in support of the, the traditional theory. So it's at the late 200 or the late 100s, which we have a, a quote from Irenaeus that attests to John, a, a John being the author, a disciple John. Not, he doesn't mention an apostle John, he mentions a, a disciple John. Uh, but that's, that's you know, the first uh, reference by a church father or um, theologian. We are without any definite evidence to show that this gospel was attributed to John by the name of any writing before the time of Arrhenius. So we have a very late attestation of uh, John being written by John. And the, the critical analysis typically points to John having a late date in the early second century typically in the range of 100 to 125, the first quarter of the second century. So it's a second century document. Um, another issue is the initial use, and I'm not going to go into the details of how they co converge on this, this uh, time frame, but if you look at the references in the description uh, on the LukePrimacy.com criticism of John Page, um, it provides the excerpts of these and it goes into those, um, it goes into that, how, how this date is derived at. Um, another issue is the initial use and attestation of the gospel by the Gnostics. The Gnostics were the, you know, Gnostics were the first to actually use the gospel. Um, and late adoption by the proto-Catholics or Orthodox Christians. And so we see the adoption by Orthodox Christians in the late second century but before that, it was used by Gnostics. And here we have a quote from F.F. F. Bruce, who was also an acclaimed scholar, uh, evangelical scholar, on the canon of Scripture. Of the four Gospels, John took longer to win universal acceptance among Catholic Christians than others because almost from its first publication, some Gnostic schools treated it as though it supported their positions. The earliest known quotation from John comes from the Gnostic writer, Balsalides, around 130, the earliest known commentary of John was written by the Gnostic Heracletian about 180. So our first references of the use are, are by Gnostics. And it's only until Arrhenius that we have uh, 
uh, clear use by an, by the Orthodox camp or the Proto-Catholic camp. Going on, yeah, so early Gnostic use continued. This is another reference. Manuscript evidence of the early use of the, the gospel becomes the more interesting and important if it is held that neither Ignatius nor any other of the apostolic fathers can be shown to have known it. Even Justin shows only the first tentative use of the gospel by an Orthodox Christian. The Gnostic heretics instead had used the gospel earlier, and this earlier Gnostic use and the early Orthodox disuse together constitute one of the major problems with the early history of the gospel. The data also lead to the conclusion that the gospel was written not, as tradition maintains, in Ephesus, but in Alexandria. And there's four points here to support this view. The two papyri uh, prove the gospel was used in Alexandria before AD 150. So there's these um, papyri fragments that were discovered in Alexandria. They're... Um, or um, attributed to Alexandria. And it is not certain that Ignatius knew the gospel. Knew the gospel, this is the earliest evidence for its existence. So when it says Ignatius, it's not even certain that Ignatius knew the gospel, that there's certain things Ignatius, you know, that um, are quoted in some, some earlier writings, but it's not necessarily clear that these are direct quotes from the gospel of John. B, the Alexandrian Gnostics are known to have used the gospel. C, internal evidence points to this, in the same direction. Alexandria is the home of Philo and the other authors of the corpus, the, the Hermetics, Hermeticium, was likely the place for the development of Christian Logos doctrine and uh, from a suitable backdrop for the simultaneous anti-Docetic and anti-Judaic polemic of the gospel. So if Alexandria is the home, Alexandria is associated with the development of uh, wisdom, um, logos, uh, philosophy, uh, philo, just a lot of philosophical speculation out of Alexandria. The historical reputation of the Alexandrian church would account for the slow reception of the gospel by Orthodox Christians. So again, um, the consensus by, by scholarship is that you know, or the observation is that um, Gnostics put the, the Gospel of John to use before established uh, proto-Orthodox fathers did. Uh, the next issue is that of several hands, um, Professor B.W. Bacon of Yale University for more than 30 years has written with the fullness and fertility of Johannian criticism in periodical literature. The gem of most of Dr. Bacon's latter work is to be found in 25 vivid pages of this little introduction. At the time, he, recon he recognized three hands in the gospel. A, to the witness that may be traced to the conscious authority and superior knowledge displayed in a number of passages where the Johannian narrative is to be preferred to the synoptic. So, He's saying that there's there's a few cases where there's insight and detail that's provided, and he's attributing that particular source material to an eyewitness, an early uh, uh, observer and authority. And B, the original reporter of the Apostles' testimony. So, so this is in recognition that uh, the Gospel of John may in have incorporated earlier source material that may have historical accuracy, um, be the, the reporter, the person who actually drafted the Gospel of John, by and large, it is an elder, someone who came later. Uh, the elder is the profound and cultural mind to whom we also owe the epistles. So it, it's basically saying there's source material that may be attributed to an earlier witness, but, but by and large, the reporter of the apostolic, the apostle's testimony, that is the, the author of the Gospel of John as we know it, um, took took this source material, and um, 
wrote the gospel as we know it. Uh, the author of the appendix. So we see that there are, is a later hand in which certain things were added. Uh, the appendix in chapter 21, who compiled the Gospels, we, we now read it, is responsible for the many comments through the books, for the insertion of several narratives which show a misunderstanding of the original author's aim, and above all, for the grave dislocations of the material which led Tatian, Tatian uh, to make a number of rearrangements within the jo Johannian passage when constructing his, um, his work, Diatessarian. Um, so Tatian um, put together a harmony, and when, Tatian, when he put together this harmony, he rearranged things in the Gospel of John, and the rearrangement indicates that um, the gospel as we know it now isn't isn't the best arrangement in terms of order and uh, there being sections that are <laughs> out of place. Uh, and that this points to dislocations, dislocations being the next issue. Uh, the discovery of the Sinaitic Syriac version of the gospels started suggestions that a textual dislocation had taken place at a very early stage in the history of the text of the fourth gospel. Many varieties and rearrangements have been proposed by different scholars. So what it's saying here is that um, from a, the indication is that from a very early stage, things got mixed up. Basically, things were shuffled. Um, leave... In several places, internal evidence raises a strong suspicion that sections of the gospel are not in the right order. A growing weight of opinion finds the explanation in the theory of dis displacement of leaves. Some attribute this to an accident which could be further manuscript um, be further manuscript after the writer's death and the carelessness of the editor who regrouped the scattered leaves. Others with greater probability think the writer left his manuscript in a perfect, perfectly uh, in perfect, in perfectly arranged, and the reference in which he uh, was held by his disciples prevented any change in the manuscripts as it had been left beyond a few words here and there. The discovery that in several of the places where rearrangement is required on internal grounds, the displaced sections are as regard length multiples of a fixed unit has done much to remove this hypothesis from a class of capricious and subjective speculation. So what they found is that um, these displacements indicate that leaflets of approximately the same number of words uh, and so that that um, dispels a hypothesis that it's actually the author's intent to to make it um, to um, to provide the gospel as, as we now see it. So if you look at this chart here on the, the right, uh, these are different scholars who have different theories of order of how uh, the gospel of John should be correction, corrected in terms of the order and sequence of um, chapters and verses sections. And typically these agree on some major points, but then some of them go into gr greater detail than others. A glance at the table of proposed rearrangements in Appendix D will show what a large measure of agreement there is among those scholars who are convinced that the present order of the sections in the fourth gospel does not agree with the intention of the evangelist himself. Uh, the next issue, disturbances or discontinuities. There are many signs that the gospel was not left in the form of a finished work. There are also indications that the writer went over his rough draft, adding fresh incidents, or meditations, inserting comments, elaborations, reconsiderations. It is in this way, probably, that we attain an understanding of, an, of the otherwise perplexing interruptions, complexing interruptions, in the thought and rhyme of the prologue, and the duplications and as some have said, the inconsistencies of the farewell discourse. It has often been observed that the sequence of thought and the prologue run smoothly if the verses relating to John and the Baptist are omitted, uh, verses 6 through 8 and 15. 
if these uh, verses originally came immediately before verses 19, they would form an opening for the gospel, not unlike the beginning of Mark. When the prologue was written and prefixed to the rough dra draft of the gospel, these verses may have been, been may as may well have been detached from their former position and inserted into the prologue to emphasize the subordination of the Baptist or to bring his witness into prominence. So there, there, there was some uh, motivation to interpolate, to add. Uh, there seems to be some evidence that in the prologue or the, the possibility of that. Style of speech, uh, the next issue. It is a just criticism which insists that the evangelist's idea, if sublime, are few, and that they are continually reiterated in a well-nigh identical form, that there is a poverty of vocabulary, a sameness in matter of presentation. If the same great concepts and ideas reoccur over and over again, the, the language becomes almost monotonous. colorless, yes, almost poor. The admission is abundantly necessitated that precisely these features are ever and again illustrated in the speeches of the personages who play their respective parts in the wonderful drama of the fourth gospel story. There is little, if any, variety in the manner of their discourse. Admittedly, their language is Johannian, Johannian, um, or put it thus, the evangelist has fashioned a speech particular to his school. And it is in that speech that all his characters discourse. So stylistically, again, everyone's speaking in the same style, this, uh, this phraseology and, and um, form that is attributed to the author himself. <laughs> The next issue, style and tone. When this weighty consideration arises, no matter who the personages are, the speeches which the evangelist purports to report are assuredly characterized by a remarkable sameness of style or tone. They, the said personages, each one with an individual individuality proper to himself, must truly have displayed their individuality in a manner of their discourse. They are certainly not found to do so, and the conclusion is unavoidable that the asserted ear witnesses, it, ear witness evangelist is anything but a true witness if ver verity be contingent on exactness of report. The speeches must be, to some extent, constructed speeches, in any case, the evangelist has allowed himself a very free hand, to which it may be added that his own reflections are sometimes so merged in reported conversation or discourse that it is no easy thing to decide who precisely is the speaker. Sometimes difficulty is less, thus in the case of uh, the, the third chapter of John, 16 through 22 and 31 through 36, where we have in all likelihood the ponderings of the evangelist rather than the words assigned respectively to Jesus and the Baptist. So, you know, John 3.16 is one of the most um, beloved verses, but this there seems to be in the third chapter of John, um, these are the words of the narrator as opposed to the words of Jesus. Um and so we see a seamless transition between the words of Jesus and the narrator speaking and sort of elaborating on the significance and uh, in relation to, to what is being presented. Uh, and so you just see these seamless transitions between Jesus speaking and the narrator in the, in the same stylistic uh, manner. The next issue, general characteristics. The message of the kingdom, which forms the one subject of his teachings in the Synoptic Gospels, falls practically out of sight 
and our attention is fixed instead on his own personality and its relation to God and the significance for the world. We discover on closer examination that this gospel differs from others, not only in its general view of the nature of Christ's mission, but in its reading of the history itself. The chief scene of our Lord's ministry again was Galilee, according to the synoptic traditions, is placed in Jerusalem in John. Even where the fourth evangelist is in closest agreement with the synoptics, he never fails to introduce some modification in detail, often at such a nature as to change the whole meaning of the event. So like when similar events are covered, um, the whole nature of the event is sort of altered and, and re reframed in John. And, and the emphasis has changed. Uh, in the event that the material has undergone a process from whatever source he derived it, whether or not from our synoptic gospels or, for some, or from some other traditions, equally trustworthy, the writer has molded it anew. He's molded it anew and brought it into harmony with his own conceptions. What we have before us is not a literal history of the Lord's life, but a jo jo Johinian interpretation of that life. Johannian <laughs> um, interpretation of that life. The writer views all the facts not as they are in themselves, but through an atmosphere of symbolism. It is already observed by Clement of Alexandria at the beginning of the third century that since the bodily things have been exhibited in the other gospel, John, inspired by the spirit, produced a spiritual gospel. The spiritualizing of history is mainly his aim throughout. So according to Clement, John is a, a spiritualizing of the history. And in that spiritualizing, we see that there's <laughs> the actual narration itself. The circumstances and details aren't, aren't necessarily historical. The history resolves itself at every point to a kind of allegory, which cannot be rightly apprehended without a key. In this, we must explain the liberties strange to our modern mind, which the writer continually takes with historical facts. The event as it happened was due, uh, in reference to the uh, abbration, abdubration, necessarily dim and imperfect of a spiritual life, his interest in the idea which he regards as the one essential thing, the truth or inward reality of the fact, he thinks not only it's not only permissible but necessary to modify the fact so as to bring out more fully the empirically, emphatically the idea of the heart of it. Sorry for the um, misreading there. Um so as to bring out more fully or emphatically the idea of the heart of it. So he's basically changing the facts in order to emphasize um, the idea that he's trying to convey, the deeper wisdom and, uh, you know, meaning conveying, the, you know, the deeper teaching within it. Other issues, the subordinate aims. When we look below the surface of the fourth gospel, we seem to discover clear traces of this interest in the contemporary life of the church. Several of the more striking particularities of the gospel are not capable of expl explanation until we read it not only as a, a history of Jesus, but as a tract, a tract for the times called forth and by the practical requirements of the second century. So it's saying that this is sort of recast revisionist presentation of the gospel that's relevant to the issues of the second century. We know that the first issue epistle is directed against certain heretical teachers. These appear to have been precursors for later Gnostics. And it is highly probable, but that the same time type of heretical teaching is combated in the gospel. But while the evangelist is less strongly opposed to Gnosticism, there is reason to believe that he himself has been touched by Gnostic influences. He makes frequent, frequent use of well-known Gnostic watchwords. He draws a Gnostic distinction between the two classes of men, the earthly and the spiritual, 
the children of darkness and the children of light. With all his instances on the reality of the Savior's life, he never loses sight of its ideal significance. The two twofold attitude to the Gnostic speculations is one of the chief problems of the gospel. In order to solve it fully, we should require to know something of the personality of the writer and the particular circumstances in which he wrote. So this is a this is an observation that there are Gnostic concepts and there is some Gnostic influence in the writer um, sort of appealing to maybe Gnostically minded or philosophically minded Hellenized Jews and, and Christians, Greeks, um, but not necessarily the gospel itself is, um, is Gnostic, but that it, it um, addresses Gnostic ideas to some, to some extent. Under the form of a, a biography of Jesus, it deals with problems and difficulties which do not arise until after his death. It bears a constant reference not only to the events which it narrates, but to the situation of the church in the early part of the second century. So again, it seems the subordinate and it aims uh, appear to be um, um, directed towards issues and the, the character of the church um, primarily directed towards Hellenized Jews and Greeks in the early second century. <clears throat> now we get into the, the, the main topic of, of this article that was posted on Facebook and that's referenced in the description. And this is where the most compelling evidence, I believe, lies. Um, it's the contrast between the Gospel of John and between the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, the impossibility of finding a place for the raising of Lazarus in the historical framework of Mark, of Mark decides against the historicity of that story. The most serious count against the fourth gospel from the point of view of objective external history is the attitude assigned to Jesus in his discourses with the Jews. There is an argumentativeness, a tendency to mystification about the utterance of the jo Johannian Christ which, taken as a report of actual words spoken, is positively repellent. After describing the debates reported in chapter um, 10 and 13, Dr. Burkett concludes it is quite... Well, actually, that's 5 and 8. <laughs> Dr. Burkett, uh, Burkett concludes it is quite inconceivable that the historical Jesus of the Synoptic Gospels could have argued and quibbled with opponents that he is represented to have done in the, in the fourth gospel. The only possible explanation is that the work is not history, but something else cast in historical form. Um, so this quote brings up several issues. The first is the raising of Lazarus. It's such a spectacular miracle uh, that Lazarus being dead for four days that if this were really a historical fact, there's no reason that the synoptics would have omitted it. Lazarus was considered, according to John, a, a beloved uh, by, by Jesus. And uh, so word of that would have spread far and wide and being one of the most spectacular miracles, again, there'd be no reason. So that points again against it being uh, historical. And then the whole nature of Jesus, is, Jesus and John being argumentative and everything sort of being spoken uh, in a cryptic, mystical way that, that's just so, so different than the way Jesus speaks uh, in the synoptics, which you really see as a different character and personality of Jesus uh, in, in John as you, as you do in the synoptics. Um, so... It's just hard to imagine um, the historical Jesus being consistent with the Jesus portrayed uh, in, in reference to his character uh, in the Gospel of John. So uh, this is the article, the problem. Uh, this is the book that references these contrasts. Um, and uh, that I have a publication on or that I published an article on on. Uh, the website 
And this has a, a chapter that really does well at um, contrasting the Johannian and Johannian, Johannian versus the synoptic uh, representation. Um, in terms of chronology, the scene of the ministry, John the Baptist, the miracles, the discourses, the synoptic uh, and Johannian portraits of Jesus, and the summary and conclusions. Um, so I'll, I'll walk through those here. So in the introduction portion of this chapter, um, now where objection is raised, the marked particularity of the fourth gospel is highly attenuated, attenuated. Uh, it is regarded not as the record of historical facts, but as a manual of instruction, which is the which the theme is Jesus, the divine logos manifested in the flesh. The view further is that the synoptic Jesus, human in his every lineament and child of his own age and people, is altogether unrecognizable in the Johannian Christ. It is further urged that our gospel and the synoptics part company in the case of other personages and they are utterly at variance on matters amongst others of locality and date. Or reasons such as, uh, as these, there is widespread agreement that whatever be its interest and value as an early Christian document, the fourth gospel must be ruled out as a source for the life of Jesus. The fourth gospel does in many respects present a striking contact to, contrast to its three companions. Common features and resembles there may be, the fact remains that discrepancies are both numerous and of such nature as to stare the instructed reader in the face. So the observation is that, you know, the, the, the discrepancies are so numerous and of such nature to just be unignorable. Of our fourth Canonical gospel, John is clearly the latest, and perhaps the latest by a long way. As for the remaining three, they are near to the events they purport to relate, and it is safe to say that the synoptic tradition that stretches back to the apostolic times and to the very days of Jesus. The independent attitude of the fourth evangelist is manifested by his extension of the duration of the ministry and his bold transp transpositions. Transpositions as basically shifting uh, events and dates. It certainly appears from the synoptic representation that the public ministry of Jesus began and extended within a single year. Otherwise, the fourth evangelist who expands to a, it to a period which includes the, at least three Passovers to turn to the cleansing of the temple, according to the fourth gospel, it has occurred at the beginning of the ministry while it is placed by the synoptics at the close of the ministry. So this is another big one, the cleansing of the temple. Um, huge difference in chronology. And the cleansing of the temple is supposed to be the catalyst for why Jesus was, um, was uh, uh, it's kind of the climax of, of the Jews being frustrated with his ministry and that kind of being the final straw. And it is evidently regarded by them that the decisive act which perpetuated the death of Jesus, you know, that is the cleansing of the temple. So if the, cleans if the cleansing of the temple is associated with a decisive act which per perpetuated the death of Jesus, uh, it doesn't make any sense in John why it's at the be very beginning of John. Harmonists have struggled to escape the difficulty the balance of probability is surely against the jo Johannian dating for the position of the, tho the uh, story in the synoptics is natural, while in the case of our gospel, that is John, it has rather the effect of an anticlimax. Um, so in terms of the natural chronology and narration, it belongs at the end of the ministry, not at the beginning. Another instance of violent alteration, as it would appear, is that of the respective datings of the death day of Jesus, take first the synoptic representation. 
Jesus, it would appear, celebrates the Passover with the twelve. They depart from the upper room with the scene changes from the Mount of Olives to a place where which was named Gethsemane, uh, if I pronounce that right. Quickly there follows the arrest. As for the crucifixion, it takes place the day after the celebration of the Passover. Not to say, not so, says the fourth evangelist. So he tells of a supper partaken of by Jesus and his friends, while nowhere stating that the number of the latter was limited to the twelve. Far from identifying that supper with the the, the Passover meal, uh, he is at pains to make it understood that the Passover still lay ahead, and that when the night of its celebration had arrived, the body of Jesus was already in the tomb. In regard to the day of the month, the, the synoptics assign it to the fifth of Nisan, Nisan, John to the 14th, 15th verses the 14th, they are accordingly in flat contradiction with regard to date. So this is kind of a, clearly there's a stark, stark contradiction between uh, the, the Passover, the, the Last Supper. Uh, in the synoptics, it's on the Passover. In, in the John, it's the day before the Passover. And there's just no way to avoid this contradiction. Uh, another issue is the scene of the ministry. Again, I already brushed upon this uh, in the synoptics, the Galilean homeland, in John, uh, Judea, Jerusalem. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a major discrepancy and inconsistency. Also, the way that John the Baptist is portrayed. John the Baptist, who figures in the fourth gospel, wears you know, slight or, or any resemblance at all to John the Baptist in the synoptic presentation. The two portraits are singularly unalike. It is possible that the real Baptist had no definite, uh, at, at no time definitely attached himself to the cause of Jesus, but went his own way and rushed in to a self-invited fate. Like, so in, in, for instance, in the synoptics, John, you know, John sends his disciples and asks, if Jesus is the Christ, indicating that, that John wasn't necessarily certain, and that the, and it also indicates that John was still engaging in ministry in parallel with Christ. Uh, but in the first chapter of John, John emphatically says, "This is the Christ. You know, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world." Um, so there's pronouncements made by by John that that. If these pronouncements were made, why wouldn't uh, the synoptics uh, uh, include them and incorporate them? And what we what we see is basically John is sort of in a revisionist sense, um, making John the putting the words on John John the John the Baptist's mouth of of attesting to to the uh, the. The, the revelation of who Jesus is, but in in the synoptics we see Peter making the confession, "You are the Christ," and that being uh, an indication that that's the core revelation that comes later in the ministry that doesn't come right up front in the very first chapter uh, by by his disciples. Um, in terms of miracles, there's also very stark contrasts. The contention is raised that the fourth gospel is in contrast with the synoptics in that along with the changed motives and with significant omissions, the element of the miraculous is strongly enhanced. Basically that John embellishes the miracles, that the miracles are more spectacular. Um, and uh, enhance. We will observe in the first instance that one particular class of miracles is excluded from the fourth evangelist. In the case of synoptics, there is frequent mention of demonic cures performed by Jesus. And by the way, it is widely connected, conceded that he did actually heal many, a sufferer to. And the conception of, of the age was possessed by an evil spirit. No such narratives occur in the fourth gospel. So I get, this is saying that the emphasis on Jesus curing 
uh, demoniacs, those who are possessed by demons, having a deliverance ministry is completely omitted from the Gospel of John. Um, no such narratives occur in the fourth Gospel. John knows nothing, nothing whatsoever of the most frequent wonder works of Jesus, the healing of demoniacs, or rather, he declines to admit such synoptic stories in his own Gospel. So if if deliverance of um, and exorcisms were such an integral part of his ministry, again, John omits what is a core and integral part of Jesus' ministry by, by omitting the, those miracles. It must be said, then, that there is an enhancement of John. With the works of healing, the effect is heightened. In one case, the cure is performed from a considerable distance. You know, he's basically performing miracles from, from, a, from a distance. In another, blindness from birth. You know, people who... Um, in a third, uh, em empathetically said of the sick man that he had been no less than 30 and eight years in his infirmity. So the idea here is that the ones that John selects, the healing episodes are of those who either it's from birth or from years and years of infirmity. And the idea is in this context, um, it, it'd be easier to heal um, someone who has a more recent uh, infirmity as opposed to someone who's been infirm their, their, practically their entire life. The narrative which points to Bethany suggests unmistakably that the cor corpse already four days in the tomb had seen corruption. So at the very precipice is this raising of Lazarus, the most spectacular miracle of all, where you know he's four days dead and he's already seen corruption. His body's already starting to decay. And, and if such a, 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 a miraculous, you know, spectacular miracle again occurred, it makes no sense why the synoptics would have omitted that. It is true to say that whereas the miracles of healing in the synoptics are miracles of mercy and compassion, wrought because Jesus had sympathy with the suffering sufferers, the miracles recorded by the fourth evangelist tend to the glory of him who wrought them. They are, they are proofs not to his humanity, but his divinity. So in John, the miracles are used to attest uh, of of who Jesus is and to, 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 to sort of collaborate uh, to, to support that. In, in reference to the, the, the synoptics, it's more Jesus being um, in sympathy and how things unfolded. He's, he's healing and um, um, exercising mercy and compassion on those who need, who need help. So we don't see as implicit a theological motivation for uh, in context to the miracles in the synoptics as we do in, in John. One of the biggest issues that's convincing to me is the discourses. And the discourses are really telling. Um, so here again, the synoptics and Johannian representations are held to be mutually exclusive. Jesus must have spoken just as the synoptics make him speak. The Christ of the fourth gospel adopts the theological and philosophical language of the schools. Basically, Jesus is being presented as a philosopher. So briefly stated, runs run multitudinous objections. And as had been noted in another connection, there is a strong family likeness between the criticisms of time past and time present. Let two specimens be played, placed side by side. Here in the synoptics, the popular form of oriental proverb wisdom and inventive parable, so like basically saying in the synoptics, Jesus uh, is more, um, speaks more in sort of short pr proverbial wisdom. But there in the fourth gospel, the profound allegory with, with appeal to profound reflection instead of pithy and concise statement sayings 
alike luminous and easy to retain, a series of witnesses and disputings, an exalted tone, and with further with other disregard for the capacity of the hearings. So basically, in the Gospel of John, Jesus is just speaking completely over, uh, over the heads of those who hear. And what we see in, in John is a pattern of, um, it's a motif, which Jesus continually speaks in a provocative and ambiguous way, and his audience doesn't really get what he's saying. And for the reader, we have to really dig into the context of what comes before and after particular statements Jesus makes to really understand what he means. But what Jesus is often portrayed in the Gospel of John is not even caring um, if, his, if his hearers even really understand what he's, he's saying. <laughs> uh, to continue here, according to the synoptics, the demands of Jesus are for self-renunciation, uh, for compassionate love, for taking one's self in hand, for work of for others, his warnings are directed against the dangers of riches, worldly desires, and anxieties. So Jesus is giving us a model of how we should live and how we should perceive the world around us in the synoptics. And then above all, he preaches about the kingdom of God and the conditions of entrance therein. So in, in stark contrast to that, it's not so in the fourth gospel. The preaching of the kingdom recedes while Jesus becomes the dialectician in both cases, he figures as teacher in the fourth gospel. The subject matter is his teaching and almost exclusively himself. So we have much more explicit sort of model and gui guidance for how we should live. Uh, whereas the fourth gospel is the primarily uh, the subject is to identification of, of who Jesus is. Um, Jesus as pictured in the earlier Gospels, whether he be speaking, preaching, or disputing, never has resort to dialectic skill. He's not some, you know, advanced uh, debater uh, who just goes on and on in, in rhetoric to the ambiguity of artifice, to the, the mystical style. You know, the Jesus of John isn't indicative, isn't... Uh, expressed it in the synoptics on the contrary there is almost there is almost simplicity and clearness a certain natural eloquence which owes far more to the mental genius than to, to a painfully acquired art in the fourth gospel he disputes as a dialectician you know in, in comparison to that in in, in, comp in comparison to a natural way of speaking and with eloquence um, as opposed to like some trained rhetorician. In the fourth gospel, he disputes as a dialectician, ambiguous in his language and mystical his style. He deals to such an extent in obscurities that even the very learned people are quite in the dark as to the real significance of many of his words. In one case, there are short and pregnant sayings, you know, in the case of the synoptics, parables, so full of beauty and of inward truth as to grip attention and to sink deep into the soul. In the other hand, with John, the parabolic mode of teaching is practically absent. Here the question turns on conduct, rules of life, the Mosaic law, heirs in the Jewish people. There that's, you know, here in that, in terms of the synoptics, there in terms of John, the speaker is concerned with dogma, with metaphysics, and with his own identity. There is an absence of variety in the manner of discourses generally. No matter who the speaker may be, the several characters, that is, hold converse and Johannian phraseology. And without individuality, whether the idea or, of sp idea or speech, conversations are reported at length, when apparently there is no third person at hand. So like, yeah, again, in John, we see conversations that spread over ch over uh, chapters, you know, over a long, over a long, <laughs> many verses, long conversations. Um, and these long, intricate, nuanced um, dialogues that we see in John 
like for someone to accurately reflect specifically the words spoken in this nuanced complex dialogue between Jesus and others um, uh, and, the, and then there's no there's no third party that's being mentioned who's actually recording this complicated dialogue. So it makes it more historically questionable that there's these long, sophisticated, complicated dialogues being recorded, whereas it's more likely the case that Jesus would repeat the same parables and emphasize the same points throughout his ministry as he traveled. But in John, you see these very unique uh, interactions that are that are, are, are very long and uh, nuanced. The question here being narrowed down to a single issue, the discourse is placed by the evangelist in the lips of Christ. Yeah, it's just, the fact must be reckoned with. If some of the actual sayings of the historical Jesus be embodied in our gospel, that is John, it's cer certainly not throughout a depository of genuine utterances of Jesus. So, like, you know, it's clearly the case that um, these aren't historic, these aren't genuine utterances. This is uh, using the character of Jesus to, uh, in a revisionist sense, to, to theologically uh, reinforce particular points. Now, the position has been aptly stated thus, Jesus cannot have held at the same time and style and method of teaching which the synoptics describe and that which the fourth gospel reflects. There must therefore, we must therefore attribute the language, the color, and the form of these Johannian discourses to the evangelist, that is, the author, the primary author. The gospel of John is a distillation of the life and teaching of Jesus from the conduit of the apostle's own mind. In his interpretation of the meaning of Christ's words, deeds, and per person described from intimate personal relations with him and colored and shaped by a lo long life of Christian thought and experience. So it's, it's the product, it's, a po it's the poetic product that's influenced by the experience of the author and the deep contemplation of the author. A Jesus who preached alternately in the manner of the Sermon on the Mount as compared to John 14 through 17 is a psychological impossibility. Basically, you have two different characters being portrayed. The Jesus of the synoptics isn't the same in character and psychology as the Jesus of, of, of John. What is it that God looks for, um, and what is alone decisive for life or death? The answer of the fourth gospel is, believe on the Son of God who came down from heaven and believe that he is Jesus, an answer which has a baneful effect on Christendom. For, if only, for it is only too easy to make such a profession of belief without drawing near to God and becoming a better man. You know, that is, if intellectually, yeah, you confess these things, it 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 doesn't uh, have the same emphasis on changing your life, repentance. Um, again, for it is only too easy to make such a profession of belief. That is all. If all you need to do is make such a profession of belief, without drawing near to God and becoming a better man, very different is the answer of the synoptic Jesus. For him, everything is contingent on doing the will of God which involves uprightness, brotherly love, trust in God, humility, yearnings for God's kingdom. And for those who do the will of God, he says, they are for him mother or sister or brother. Uh, so, so the emphasis in John is on uh, righteous living, serving God, doing the will of God. The emphasis that's of the synoptics, the emphasis of John is, uh, just making a confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Say what we will we'll do about differences of audience and of situation demanding different forms of address and allowing for exceptional instances. The contrast between the terse ax axiomatic statements, the simple parables of the synoptics, and the elaborate arguments of the Johannian discourses is too great to be explained away. There's just too much 
of a contrast. It's two. It's it's just way too different. It's just two different worlds uh, in, in terms of uh, comparing the synoptics with John. The contrast is sharp. It is recorded of the synoptic Jesus that men heard him gladly, in small wonder that they did when, quote, being so much in earnest with the matter, he had a unique degree in the manner at command of the Johannian Christ. Johannian Christ, it was reported that never man so spoke, spake, and the phrase scarcely explained by the context, he had been regarded as generally significant of obtruseness in the matter and matter, the manner and matter of his discourse. Basically, again, it, this is attesting that John portrays Jesus speaking in a much more ambiguous way. The way he speaks and in terms of what he's addressing, um, there's an obtruseness in John that isn't indicative of the synoptics. In one case, he so speaks as to attract and often win sympathy. In the other, he talks above people's heads. He positively invites misunderstanding. That, that is in John. There is an argumentativeness, a tendency to mystification about the utterances of the, the jo Johannian Christ, which is, in the author's opinion, positively repellent. It is quite in conceivable that the historical Jesus of the synoptics could have argued and quibbled with his opponents as he is presented, represented to have done in the fourth gospel. In the jo Johannian discourses, we feel that it is not the visible and audible Jesus who is speaking, but the Christ who is in the life of the church. And the only possible explanation is that the fourth gospel is not history, but something else cast in historical form. I read this quote previously, but it's a, a good one to reiterate. Okay, the discourses section, we're getting close to, to this. I think this is the last of two in references to the contrast with the synoptics. But this is also a very important contrast, the synoptics and the Joh Johannian portraits of Jesus. It is here contended that there is no escape from a categorical either or a sharp contrast with it, it is said, is reducible to the simple formula, here man, there God. Basically, Jesus is pr predominantly portrayed as a man in the synoptics. In, uh, in John, there's inference or at least... Um, of of divinity or more more like um conflation with divinity of christ a, a stronger conflation uh pe pe you know trinitarians would say well john speaks of jesus being deity but a unitarian can clearly see that there's a conflation of, of jesus with deity but uh it's it's in a it's in a um it's not in the sense of identity it's in the sense of predication those to whom the word of God came were called gods. But nevertheless, there is more conflation in John of Jesus and God than in the, the synoptics. Well, the synoptic Jesus advances practically uh, nothing as to the divine nature, and judging from his utterance, solely holds himself endowed with divine gifts sent, sent by God, Messiah. The Johannian Christ makes everything turn on himself. Basically, um, you know, in the synoptics, Jesus is the Messiah who's endowed with power from God. Um, and you just get a different portrayal of Jesus uh, in, in John. Therein speaks of the criticism of a century ago. In like manner that more in that of more recent times, neither does the synoptic Jesus step outside the bounds of a purely human. As for the Christ of the fourth evangelist, he is complete from the outset. For him, there is neither childhood nor youth. John admits the childhood and youth of Jesus, how Jesus developed and grew in wisdom. He is the, there out the divine word manifested in the flesh, you know, th throughout. Basically, John is just, there's no, there's no development of, of, of Jesus, you know, being conceived, growing up, 
at the baptism being endowed with power because of the baptism being sort of a unique event event that brings him to the next level and then the advancement uh, it's more like throughout the gospel jesus is just this superhero <laughs> being that that uh, from the outset is um is portrayed that way um yeah he is throughout the divine word manifest in the flesh and so again when it is said that in the fourth gospel we have a version or perversion of the master's life by a disciple who is portrayed who has betrayed him not in his self-sacrificing love but as the mighty superhuman being demonstrating recognition of the divine sonship and the messianic glory yeah so basically john's gospel dehumanizes jesus takes the um under undermines or detracts from his humanity to uh, emphasizing him being kind of a super super larger than life uh superhuman <laughs> uh and emphasis you know just in a kind of a way hinting at or teasing um pre-existence and conflation with god he who looks down from the synoptic canvas is assuredly true he is assuredly true man the jesus of any rate uh in the in mark has already reached manhood when he comes on the scene and is clear from the manner of the illusions that he shares the experiences which are common to the race he is conscious of physical needs. The strain of continued action tells on him. You know, basically, he's he he's not superhuman. He he um, he he gets fatigued, uh, stirred by the emotions, manifold by emotions, manifold lie is moved to compassion by the sp spectacle of suffering and pain. You know. He both wins and displays affection. He's capable of sternness. He gives vent to wrath. Rebuff astonishes him, and he finds himself powerless to act. He disclaims omniscience. He puts questions. If he puts questions, it is because he has need to be informed. Basically, he's portrayed as asking questions because he doesn't already know the answer. Great spiritual crises are experienced by him, and the meaning of temptation is realized to the full. He cannot do anything without prayer. And prayer is a key difference. Like the synoptics pray Jesus as a prayer warrior who's dependent on prayer, who, who departs and, and goes to pray and spends all night to pray in desolate places. He prays. Hence, seeking strength, he goes apart uh, to be alone with God. Yet strength fails him in Gethsemane. Deep terror seizes him, and he pleads as hoping for deliverance to the past, to the last. Uh, he pleads as hoping for deliverance to the last. Basically, yeah, he's saying, this is in reference to Jesus in the garden saying, um, you know, take this cup from me. <laughs> But not, nevertheless, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Basically, make it so I don't have to go through with this. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will. So even even at the last moment, he he pleads for deliverance. Um, bitter is the cry from him who his, you know in his dying moments. So Jesus in the synoptics is per portrayed with weakness and sort of the human condition of being subject to emotions, needing to be strengthened. And such things as being a true human being, being in the same condition we are. But in John, you know, the portrait of Christ is different. A portrait of his sweet, unearthly, unearthly beauty, as it has been called. It is certain of an exalted personage. There is an air of imperiousness about the Christ of our evangelist as ensuing his command, issuing his commands, he expects obedience from those who are rather summoned as his subjects than invited as his friends. The multitudes are eager to make him king precisely because they owe him a force to be reckoned with. 
His destruction is compassed by his foes. Basically, he avoids um, uh, his discourses of high manners, and it is with curious dignity that he refers to himself. Conscious dignity that he refers to himself. Sorry. Majestic is part the part played by him in the closing scenes, whether in the garden or in the, the, the high priest court. His appearance is stately and his speech serene. So it's basically saying he, he's portrayed in John with very, very limited weakness um, in humanity. The Johannian representation does not stop short here. On the contrary, it is plain that the regal personage depicted transcends mere manhood. He manifests a celestial glory. He knows all men as knowing what is in men. He tells of heavenly things as having seen and have known them. He, he has come down from heaven, and thither he will soon return. He can say, my father worketh here, here too, and I work. If eternal life be for him, knowledge of the only true God, it is equally to know him, self, Dishonor done to him is dishonor done to God. With deliberation does he say, the Father is in me and I in him. Recognizing a distinction, he affirms that he and the Father are one. Preexistent as he claims to be, he is conceived as the word of God that was with God from all eternity. So uh, again, you know, these are these conflations of preexistence, these hints of preexistence and conflation of divinity uh, that we see in John, we don't see anything close to that in the synoptics. And a Unitarian clearly sees that, you know, the pre-existence is in a prophetic sense. It's not literal, but there's these hints and innuendos of, of pre-existence in some sense and of conflation with, uh, with deity. It must nevertheless be owned that a contrast is presented which finds no significant, sufficient, which finds no sufficient explanation. Almost done. <laughs> With every allowance has been made for powers of adaptation and varied environment, it is impossible to believe that the historical Jesus was really accustomed to discourse after the manner of the Johannian Christ. The former lives and moves in the synoptic gospel. So, you know, the real Christ, the real historical Jesus, lives and moves in the synoptic gospels. Uh, we, we kind of addressed the contrast on the gospel of the kingdom being preached in John in the synoptics and very very few references of the of the kingdom of God uh, in the um, gospel of John and the kingdom the gospel of John focuses on this concept of life whereas it's the kingdom of God which is more emphasized in the synoptics so to summarize, I only have a few slides left. From our knowledge, rather than of what Jesus was when he appeared on earth, we can discern him still and receive the new truth which imparts to us through his living spirit. The fourth gospel is the grandest illustration of this profound and far-reaching doctrine. Within a new century, you know, the second century, for people of alien race and culture, the evangelist goes back to the teaching of Jesus but he does not simply reproduce what has been handed down. He translates it into a new language. He interprets it with the aid of a layer of theological forms. He brings it to relation contemporary problems and interests, which has not yet emerged in the master's own lifetime. Literary considered, literally considered the message is different from what had come down in the tradition. The words attributed to Jesus had not actually fallen from his lips, and the whole picture of his earthly life and surroundings is in many respects altered. He availed himself of categories of thought unknown to the prim primitive age, that is to first century, the first century in the early church, the earliest church, which were derived mainly from the philosophy You know, that is the author. Um, he availed himself of categories of thought 
unknown to the primitive age, which were derived mainly from philosophies of Greece, these new categories were in many way, ways well fitted to express Christian ideas, but it cannot be denied that something was lost by the adaptation, the adoption of them. The teaching of Jesus became abstract and mystical instead of simple and direct. An appeal was made to the intellect more than to the underlying instincts of the moral and religious life. It asserted in itself heir of five centuries of Greek thinking. It was it, you know, basically it was in reference to the general culture of the time and penetrated more and more in, with its own spirit. To the fourth evangelist, more than any other teacher, the church was indebted, indebted for the mighty progress of the next three centuries. He transported a new religion from its Jewish soil into another. Basically, it's a transposition of a religion directed um, in reference to the Jewish context into it, basically appealing to uh, the Greek world, the Hellenized world. It is true that in this endeavor to portray Jesus in his earthly ministry as the ever-living Christ, the evangelist has modified and idealized the facts as a work of history, his gospel is secondary to the synoptic records, and its evidence must always be sifted and controlled by means of them. So in conclusion, there are numerous issues of the Gospel of John that cannot be glossed over. John has elements of truth, but much fiction in terms of historical accuracy. As a historical document, it is largely apocryphal. That is, you know, historically it's inaccurate. Um, and should not be the primary reference for understanding the historical Jesus. Now, to say it's largely apocryphal doesn't mean to say it's completely apocryphal. There may be elements within it that are historically accurate. It's just that there are many that are not. So I'm not saying it's completely in inaccurate and everything is inconsistent with the historical record. It's, it's just that it's largely not. We should not throw it away or discard it as it conveys theological truths and beliefs of early Christians. However, it should be a secondary reference for establishing core doctrine, essential belief and practice. Yeah, let's let's keep the Gospel of John. Let's use it as a reference for theological truths, but it's a secondary reference. Those references that are more aligned with first century apostolic Christianity should be used as the, the foundational authorities. And John, which is attributed to the, the second century church, should be considered a secondary authority. John is one of the most Unitarian books in the New Testament with explicit indications of subordination and dependency. So I have no problems debating John in terms of whether it's Unitarian, what the meaning of particular verses and passages are. Uh, you know, I have a lot of experience with John and, and believe it's completely Unitarian. So it's not a theological motivation to, uh, to, to point out these issues. Um, I don't believe it teaches a literal pre-existence and that Christ is ontologically God. I do believe it emphasizes Jesus as the fulfillment of God's revelation and prophecy, that it, he pre-existed in a prophetic sense, and that Jesus is God by predication, that is, he's the agent of God. Uh, he's endowed with the power and authority of God and the prerogatives that are normally associated with God but that doesn't mean he's ontologically God. John, by and large, is poetic and inspirational, and it stirs up the imagination. So a lot of Christians say, well, John is so influential in people becoming believers, um, and, and that's why we should hold it at such high esteem. And we should hold it at some esteem, high esteem, but we should be, we should be honest about it. Uh, you could say that like, a lot of people are... Muslims, because the Quran is so inspirational and poetic, and and and, and just because something is written to be uh, poetic and inspire, inspirational doesn't mean make it historically accurate. 
And so we need to be honest with, with the, these issues and, and to just be clear that it, it, we don't have to regard it as historically accurate to regard it as having value from a theological standpoint. So that being said, that concludes my presentation, which was almost two hours. My gosh. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah, it's, um, there's a, you know, there's some archaic language used in these references. And um, the uh, sorry if I stumbled over reading some of this. Most of what I read are, are statements of others, but I'm pretty much in agreement, but not necessarily 100% agreement with all these statements. But it, at least it gives you that perspective, the critical perspective. And again, on, on the website that I have, I have seven books with excerpts. These theologians, these critical scholars, these weren't atheists. These weren't people trying to uh, destroy faith. The, the, their main objective was um, converging on the truth. And that should be that should be our objective as well. Um, so I didn't look at the I didn't look at the comments while I was reading that because I had to, I had to pretty much focus on a lot uh, to uh, to digest. Maybe in the future we'll have an open stream and we can flush some of these these issues out uh, with dialogue. I Thanks for Faithful for being there. And uh, uh, again, I don't reject the Gospel of John, whoever said that. I'm not rejecting the Gospel of John. I mean, it, I, I still hold the Gospel of John to be an important authoritative reference for understanding core theological principles of the Christian faith. I just don't think it's historically accurate. So that's the position of James Dunn. <laughs> that's the position of uh, mainline scholarship. Maybe it's an open secret that lay people aren't aware of, but that's, that's, um, that's what the evidence points to. Um, Anyone else have any comments um, that I can address? I, I guess I can't read through a bunch of comments, but at this point, <laughs> I'm hungry and it's it's I've, it's been a mouthful. I've I've been pretty much just reading for um, two hours straight. Um, but yeah, there are going to be fundamentalists who just have a reactionary response. They just want to demonize me for just. Um, Honestly, you know, trying to pursue the truth. I'm trying to converge on what foundational authorities we should use for understanding the basics of the Christian faith. If you want to use John to sort of elaborate on and nuance, like, you know, theological things that are um, that are true, that's fine. But what the basic understanding of what you need to believe and to do to be a Christian should be. Like Luke and Acts <laughs> should be sufficient for understanding those core fundamentals. We shouldn't need John to to, to further enlighten us, to give us something that um, Luke and Acts doesn't encompass, because the whole point of Luke and Acts is to have um, accuracy and uh, a comprehensive chronological account of Jesus's ministry and the ministry and preaching of the apostles with continuity between the two and to be communicated as clearly and directly as possible whereas in John you know you you basically have something that appeals that appeals to to philosophically minded people who like to speculate about uh, certain things but, you know, that speculation isn't the essential aspect of being a Christian. Otherwise, you would have to say that Luke and Acts is deficient for the for for conveying what really is at the heart and really at, at what it means to believe. Um, yeah, Anthony Buzzard didn't chime in. Um, I don't think he will today. He wanted to talk about 
why the Socinian interpretation of the prologue is wrong. So I don't, I don't think you wanted to actually address the topic that I'm uh, addressing now, but I might bring him in if he's, um, if anyone who um, wants to dialogue in good faith, I might bring them on the show uh, and have a dialogue with them. Yeah. And I, I know that I've, I've received some warnings from people you know, proceed with caution that this is something that could um, could undermine people's faith. And I, the same thing could have been said of the Protestant Reformation. It's like, oh, you're undermining the authority of tradition. You're undermining the authority of the church. Like, if if they're so wrong, and if this institution that has been so immense and overpowering of of Europe and most of the world was wrong, then why, why believe in Christianity at all? At all? And so the, the thing is, yeah, I'm not here to undermine people's faith. I totally believe in the gospel wholeheartedly, but I think we should pursue the faith in a way that's the, the strongest foundation, it's most the most defensible historically, as opposed to muddy the waters and to invite... Um, to, to be disingenuous because there are the, you know, people, you know, the people are not minding the faith. They don't, you know, I, I'm not needed to do that. There's people everywhere like, um, you know, Bart Ehrman who makes a career out of undermining the faith. And these people who, who hear Bart Ehrman's arguments and could see that, some of them may be biased and um, not very strongly supported, but there are certain things where, in, in general, critical scholarship agrees. Um, for instance, the uh, you know the historical accuracy of John. People like James Dunn acknowledge that that's the kind of the exception, um, and so. If we're going to appeal to, to people who are critical or, or skeptical about Christianity, we need to come to these people with sort of an honest, integral, you know, with integrity of, uh, yeah, there, we, we acknowledge these issues, but we have a solution to resolve these issues. We can make a distinction between foundational authorities, which were early and authority, you know, of, of highest authority for informing fundamental practice and belief. From, from things which are, you know, of the second century or which are derivative works, which are supplemental or secondary. And then on those foundational authorities, which we can defend with tooth and nail as being highly credible and reliable, then, then we can make a rational, strong case for um, that, that we do have that our faith can be defended. We don't have to have the superstitious traditional belief that the canon handed down is, is infallible and inerrant to have a genuine and real confidence in the truth of the gospel. And my, my position is you just can't go wrong with Luke, Luke and Acts. Like if I just follow Luke and Acts to, to the teal, like... To, <laughs> You, you can't go wrong because all the essential information is conveyed there. And people want to make a, a life out of arguing and contending about ideological factions and doctrines that, that, that are peripheral to those essential truths. Um, and I think it's counterproductive. I think the outside world sees Christians as just constantly arguing about doctrines that are peripheral to the core gospel message. And people want to, amen for Luke and Acts, brothers, soul, amen. So, yeah, um, I believe Luke and Acts should be the foundational authority for what we understand as the essentials. And how could you say I'm not a brother? What, because I don't agree with the, a, tradition, a later tradition of canon in the sense that all these authorities are 100% inerrant? Like, obviously, these, what we have, what we have is what we have. And we need to base our faith on 
the apostolic writings, but that doesn't mean we can't critically evaluate and make it, make it a clear determination of what a distinction within the traditional canon of those authorities which are foundational and those which are, again, su supplemental. Um, so forgive me for my limitations in uh, being able to <laughs> to read and pronounce certain words, but like this uh, this uh, information is all just extracted from the one website uh, on LukePrimacy.com in reference to criticism of John. So if you really want the knowledge and the the reference. Um, That'll be there. I might uh, actually also post a PDF of this presentation so people can read through it um, in the in the description. So come back again at another time. If you miss certain parts, come back and uh, catch up with it. <laughs> um, yeah, and I, I'm not trying to be. Um, I'm trying to present the case, present the rationale, um, and you're able to make your own decisions. I'm not trying to manipulate you and control you by fear and intimidation, by trying to ostracize you and uh, rebuking you as not being part of a brother or sister in Christ because you don't agree with, with me. Uh, we really need to, to emphasize the essentials and the fundamentalism that holds the traditional canon of, of Scripture as infallible and inerrant uh, in every sense is ob obviously obsolete and it's it's misguided uh, and, and we need to move beyond that and we need to just to have a um mindful honest sincere approach to our faith in in which we can defend our faith on the most defensible and solid ground possible and uh that's that's what i'm attempting to do i'm not in any time looking to become to apostate from my my faith my faith is everything to me i'm going to die being a believer i'm not going to reject paul i'm not you know people can speculate all they want about where this is heading um this is <laughs> uh i'm a believer and um and again if you if you hold luke and acts to be foundational and you follow it, and you you converge on that being what you believe and accept, and you accept it with faith, and you live out your life accordingly, you can't go wrong. And um, people just speculate with their, their an, you know, a heart of judgment and basically being alarmed and uh, infuriated, infuriated that... Um, that I'm going against their 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 dogma. That they want to attack me and villainize me. Um, you know that's that's just that's a reactionary response to something that alarms them and scares them. And the problem is they're in ignorance. They 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 they, they want to bury their head in the sand. They don't want to come to terms with the reality and these issues. Um. And so there's basically in, you know, within with Trinitarians, Unitarians, oneness, you know, there tends to be a division between intellectuals and anti-intellectuals. Those who just dogmatically want to adhere to doctrine based on, you know, the cult of personality, someone's strong convictions of, that they have the truth uh, versus... Um, people who, who think it's important to look critically and to study original languages. And the reason why I think studying the original languages is good is it gives you more accuracy into what the intent and the original context, uh, what is being said. It, it's... To, it's in the pursuit of knowledge. And when you just buy into a traditional school of thought or a theological faction using the King James version of the Bible, you're going to be misguided and you're, come, you're going to come to uh, beliefs which are um, 
you know, you're going to come, you're going to be misdirected. So I would say don't follow any, uh, don't, you know, don't, <laughs> basically my ministry integrity syndicate is, is to emphasize the core essentials and not to be some sort of faction that over is overly specific in a number of ways that are, that are common and let's let's major on the essentials and that's we agree to disagree on peripheral issues and again this this idea that the canon existed in the first century is a false um superstition you know it's a myth myth there's a mythology of the canon that people just sort of hold as if you know god brought the canon down well if, if you believe that god gave us the canon then you believe that the Catholic Church is the instrument of God, the, the Eastern Orthodox Church that, that uh, gave us the Trinity. So what, if you reject clearly the development of dogma in terms of theology and Christology is a corruption to Christian belief and practice. If you can acknowledge that, then why can't you acknowledge that maybe um, other traditions such as the canon may not be as perfect and um unquestioning and unquestionable as possible you know as, as you would you would want you would think it is again i'm not rejecting the canon i believe we should use all these historical books that that traditionally has been accepted as apostolic in terms of the um the collection of of authorities that we refer to when we uh we defend our faith and, and we define our faith but still, that doesn't preclude that, that it's not advisable and warranted to make distinctions within the traditional canon. And the best solution to that is a two-tier system in which you have your foundational or primary authorities, and then you, you identify those authorities which are secondary. But they're still authorities. We're not discarding it. We're not getting rid of it. Uh, we're, we're maintaining the traditional canon. It's just... Um, having a, a bit more um, um, being a bit more mindful of the issues uh, that present themselves with particular books within the canon. Yeah, so uh, appreciate everyone from chiming in and watching. Um, I'm sure this is very controversial and there's been a lot of um, I've ruffled a lot of feathers. Again, I I confess <laughs> the one God and Father is the only true God, that Jesus Christ is his son, the Messiah. Theologically, I believe what uh, the Gospel of John conveys, and, and uh, it's not... Um, we should define what brings us into the body, not based on Again, things that are secondary, like um, like regardless of how how your primary or fundamental, you know, foundational authorities might differ from mine in terms of looking at the traditional canon, if the beliefs that we hold are consistent with each other, how can you say that our differences in identifying foundational authorities are really that um, are that core of an issue if if we share the same beliefs we're both biblical unitarians we believe in you know the apostolic testimony of the apostles in the book of acts we believe in uh so it's really what matters is the details and not sort of the the outward appearance of things and uh yeah i'm i'm sure I'm, i upset a few people <laughs> But um, we can agree to disagree, you know. Your ministry is your ministry. You're, you're, you can always decide who to fellowship with, what you want. But the idea is, like, I, I want to lead people astray, like, to away from the faith. No, I. if you look at integritysyndicate.com, there's articles of faith. And all those articles, I firmly, you know, <laughs> the idea is to, you know, establish um, – fellowship in terms of the core essentials 
and not to be overly restrictive when it comes to peripheral issues. And yeah, my, my, de my definition of the core essentials goes beyond believing that, you know, Unitarian theology, it go, you know, it goes into belief and practice and committing your life, living a sacrificial life and following after the model of Christ. So you want to reject me as being a believer because I, I basically take the position that uh, James Dunn takes. I mean, that's I, I just think that that's uh, <laughs> that's ridiculous. But you're welcome to take that position if you want to. In terms of uh, the the historical authenticity of John, I mean, if you look into it, the the just the, the evidence is overwhelming. Um, and if I'm going to just be blind to that evidence because I'm following a tradition of canon and a tradition of inerrancy or infallibility associated with what what is the presumption is is scripture. Um, yeah, it's just it's it's just kind of asinine to to take that approach. What's motivated by that approach predominantly is control, uh, organizational control over people sort of a cult-like system that tries to keep people conforming to their... And that's not what I'm after, you know. I'm, I'm after a sincere sort of organic approach to which the solution is, which um, reform, you know, we, we, we realize the reform that is needed. The, again, the Protestant Reformation didn't go far enough. So it sounds like a Bart Ehrman lecture. These, again, these theologians come a century before Bart Ehrman. Most of these people in these books that I'm referencing are Christian. I mean, they're all Christian. There are Christian theologians that are Trinitarian. And to say that no, Bart Ehrman is taking this criticism and taking it much further than, than where it was a century ago. But where it was a century ago was a healthy place. It was a place where, um, in the pursuit of truth, the arguments and the issues were laid out. And the settled consensus was no, which is attested by James Dunn that <laughs> you can't go to the fourth gospel for the historical Jesus. Sorry. Um Yeah, whether other whether Gnostic Gospels or apocryphal works, whether I would put John in that same category, no, I wouldn't. Um, I think it's better to keep the traditional canon, not to introduce anything into the canon, but within the canon, make it a two-tier. I think the best solution is a tier two-tier system of, of primary and secondary authorities. And so I, I wouldn't... Um, equate uh, the Gospel of Thomas with the Gospel of John. Although in some senses you can make parallels between the two, but um, I'm willing to give John higher weight because it is part of the traditional canon. And I would say it's, it, it's a better approach to um, use the traditional canon as the starting point and then by process of uh, evaluation identify what our foundational authorities versus uh, supplemental or secondary authorities. The spirit of Bart Ehrman. Uh, haha. Yeah, well, I, James Dunn, you know, I don't agree with him on many things, but he, he's uh, approaching, he's, he's appro he approaches John in a realistic sense. I mean, he's just, as as a scholar, you can't just ignore 150 years, 200 years of scholarship of dozens and dozens of works analyzing John and just be unresponsive to that. And, and um, um, typically, what a scholar, good scholarship is, is to inform your opinion based on the scholarship that preceded you. And that's what James Dunn did. Um, 
And so there's just a, mountains of evidence uh, in support of of the critical understanding that John isn't all that historically accurate. And uh, if you, yeah, I mean, if you want to just reject um, reject it, then th that's your prerogative too. But don't expect everyone else to follow you. And I would say, um, if you use fear and manipulation to to make people af afraid to look look into it for themselves, then you're going about it with the wrong spirit because. At the end of the day, if you're in my position of Lukacs' primacy as a foundational authority, you can't go wrong. You're part of the kingdom. You're a believer. You received the Holy Spirit. You repented. You've been baptized in Jesus' name. Uh, and you're following the example and model of Christ and of his apostles. So this is your judgment. It's, it's God who judges me. It's not you. You can have whatever opinion you want. But... Um, it's, um, I'm really not so concerned if you want to take an anti-intellectual fundamentalist view of things. Uh, that's not my concern. And if you want to say that I'm overly intellectual, that's, that's a misrepresentation of me. Uh, because I do have a spiritual life, spiritual vitality, spiritual experiences. If you look at my other channel, Integrity Live, you can see me, um, doing some more inspirational teaching and preaching and uh it's not it's not a question of oh you're either intellectual or you're spiritual and, and to conflate anti-intellectualism with spirituality is also a, a a a fallacy you can be intellectual and spiritual um you can be critical and spiritual as well you can take a critical approach and once you Define critically what your foundational authorities are, spiritually affirm and, and follow after uh, the metaphysical realities that are presented by them. So there's just a lot of um, mis misguided um, hostility and um, slander, trash talking against people who want to, uh, to be genuine and... Uh, look look into the facts and the information available and uh yeah i mean if it, fundamentalism is basically dogmatically defending a tradition without adequate grounds to do that and that's basically if you if you take the traditional canon dogmatically and, and you you're um Re reactionary against people who question um, that in any sense, then that that's a that's a manifestation. That's that's a type of fundamentalism. And you, yeah, you're welcome to be fundamentalist if you want. But um, I mean, I'm fundamentalist in the sense I want I want to go back to tradition. It's just I don't want to dogmatically go back to tradition. I want to go back from a um, take a systematic analytical approach to go back to the earliest tradition, the apostolic first century tradition, and, and, and not rely on a seventh century tradition of canon and some um, some <laughs> mythology of, of the canon as if God gave us the canon that we have through, you know, through the Catholic and Orthodox Church. Um, so, yeah, I'm not going to take a blind, um, dogmatic approach to what Scripture is. And if, I mean, if, if you disagree, then let's just agree to disagree, but let's not, uh, let's not spread hate and animosity towards each other. Uh yeah, I mean, people have arguments. Uh, so people can go see your arguments and um, other arguments. You can you can look at the uh, 
the arguments for, uh, yeah, I'll, I encourage people doing research. Don't just follow me blindly. But I presented, you know, a summary, uh, a sampling of the major arguments and issues that scholars have identified. And to them, it's compelling. Maybe to you, it's not. That's fine. Um, and uh, you're welcome to your opinions. And uh, we, we don't all have to agree, you know, just because we agree <laughs> that God is one. We don't have to agree on everything. We can, we can even disagree on what we think is essential doctrine. Um, you make your case, I'll make my case. And uh, to some extent, we can have a dialogue. And uh, But that's, that's where I'm at. Um, well, this is, my, this is my channel. Go ahead on your channel and make your case, man. And uh, anyways, thanks, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, I hope that you understand my heart is, uh, even if you think I'm misguided, my heart uh, is to engage in ministry, to preach the kingdom of God, the gospel, it's not just about Unitarian theology and apologetics for me. It's, it's about um, having fellowship and building, um, building a community and a movement that goes back to the, uh, goes back to the uh, first century apostolic tradition uh, and emphasizing you know, the core essentials again and operating in love, truth, and the spirit. And uh, if we share the same essential truths, praise God. And uh, but let's let's not just have a lopsided, one-dimensional faith where it's all ideological and theological. Let's have a faith that's that's rooted in faith and belief, the metaphysical aspects of interaction and, and experiencing God. Praise the Lord. And may we be grounded and rooted in love. May we interact with each other in this community in love. I know YouTube can be very toxic. But, you know, praise God for bringing people into fellowship where we can have affection and love for each other. We can um, treat each other with respect and courtesy. And uh, I thank God for what he's done in my life. I praise the Lord for the hope of the gospel. May his will be done in Jesus' name. God bless you. Much love. Peace. See you again soon. Praise the Lord.